unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Tamasha. I'm your host, Mill Invasion of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Before we get started with today's show, a quick reminder that next week on May 19th at 11 a.m. Eastern, that's 8.30 p.m. in India, we're bringing you a live episode of Grand Tamasha with our News Roundup regulars, Sadan and Dume of AEI and The Wall Street Journal, and Thanmi Madan of the Brookings Institution. You can find the YouTube link in the show notes for the week, along with details on how to submit your questions. This is a, admittedly a bit of an experiment, but we're looking forward to hanging out with you guys online. Today on the show, my guest is the New York Times journalist Sopan Deb, author of the brand new memoir, Mistranslations, Meeting the Immigrant Parents Who Raised Me. Whether it's Hassan Minaj's comedy or the spectacle of the Howdy Modi rally in Houston or Arthi Shahani's heartbreaking memoir, listeners to this show know that getting inside the Indian immigrant experience is a bit of a hobby horse of mine. At this point, I thought I'd seen all angles of the Indian American experience, that is, until I read Sopan's new book. On the surface, Sopan is a successful journalist, comedian, cultural commentator, but in his new book, he explores a side of his life that existed well below the surface. His years-long estrangement from his parents, the alienation he felt as an immigrant kid in a mostly white New Jersey suburb, and the pain and heartbreak he endured watching his family life not so much fall apart as melt away. Sopan joins me on the phone today from Charleston, South Carolina, to talk about his new book. Sopan, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. So, you know, congrats on the book. I enjoyed it immensely. In fact, once I started, uh, I really couldn't put it down. I want to I want to start this conversation kind of where the book begins. So, you know, you're on stage doing a set at a comedy club in New York City. This is back, I think, in early 2018. Your jokes are landing. The set's going well. And yet... You can't shake a sense of anxiety that's, you know, sort of at odds with what's happening on stage. You know, tell us a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, very much so. I felt like a, I felt like a fraud on stage. Um, and, and the reason I felt like a fraud on stage is, is that I was doing a lot of material about being South Asian in spite of the fact that I had spent my whole life running from being South Asian. And, and the reason for that is, um, you know, my parents were arranged to get married in the, in the 70s, and they had a very toxic arrangement. Marriage, but they but they stayed married for thirty years and had two kids because you know divorce is something that's very stigmatized in South Asian culture, and 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 the reason that matters here is I, I grew up in a very white suburb. And because of my toxicity at home, I kind of rejected my brownness. I, I didn't want to be brown. I, I idealized whiteness. And because all all my white friends around me, they seem to be having, they seem to be pretty happy, and they're you know they're they're having dinners at home with their family, and they're going on family trips, and they're you know going to see sports together or whatever, what have you. I um, I I, I ran away from being brown, and yet when I started doing stand up comedy. All I wanted to do was talk about being brown on stage. And it was this weird paradox, and it didn't feel genuine when I was on stage. And part of this journey started because of that, because I wanted to figure out kind of who I was. I, I was at, I was turning 30 around then, and I, I, I realized that I've been in the middle of a 30-year identity crisis. You know, you mentioned at one point uh, that your life was sort of a parade of running away from your skin color and yet endlessly talking about it on stage. And, you know, you sort of joke that while you're growing up, you kind of turned into the self-loathing Bengali child. Uh, you know, is Was comedy kind of a kind of catharsis or therapy for you? You know, when did you discover that comedy in a way could sort of be an outlet? Um, well, it, it is therapy. It, it is cathartic. I did not realize it was therapy until... I started thinking about why I was talking about what I was talking about. Um, it, it is cathartic in a way to talk about your family and talk about the Brown experience on stage. I didn't realize it was therapy when I was doing it. Cause when I started doing stand up, it was because of a breakup, a college breakup. Um, uh, my college girlfriend broke up with me and then, you know, I was like, well, uh, you know, I'm sad. What do sad people do? Oh, they start doing, they start doing comedy. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to do comedy now. And then when I first started doing stand um, my, my jokes were kind of like, I, I was, I was doing a terrible impersonation of like Mitch Hedberg and Jerry Seinfeld. And I remember my first joke I told was something along the lines of, you know, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about race relations. Um, has anybody here ever had sex while watching NASCAR? And I just remember that was, that was the joke. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> I, I remember it just, 
it just bombed. Like, I, I think there's video of it just silenced from the crowd. And then after a couple of seconds, someone from the back of the room yells, ha! And, uh, you know, it was my first time ever uh, getting a laugh from a crowd, but it was like, you know, over time, I, I started talking about things that were a little bit more personal, but still fraudulent. There was this like weird kind of mix of the two. And it wasn't until I started this journey that I realized, oh, you, you, there was this kind of internal turmoil that you're trying to work out on stage. And so to, to your point, yeah, it was very much therapeutic. I just didn't realize it in my seven or eight years of doing comedy. So, you know, the book really documents your very intimate personal journey to get to know your parents, to sort of understand better what happened in their volatile relationship. And in a way, I think to sort of excavate your own identity, you know, when you began the book back in 2018, you hadn't seen your parents in literally years. You described them as, quote, distant footnotes from your past. You know, did you set out to write up your journey in book form from the outset or is that something that sort of came later? Oh, no. So, uh... At first, so when I first reconnected with my parents, so actually before I reconnected with my parents, I thought, you know what? Um, what if we do this as a documentary? Because I was interested, I was, it was gnawing at me for a couple of years that I didn't have a relationship with my mom or dad. Why don't I uh, document this in some way? Because this journey is going to be whatever it is. This journey could be you know, really fulfilling. It could be horrible. It could be, you know, but not many people attempt this, I don't think. So I was like, why don't I do it as a documentary? And then I thought about it and I was like, well, why don't, well, I don't know if sticking cameras in, in, in the faces of your immigrant parents, that will probably won't make them comfortable or whatever. Um, what if, um, then let's do it as a book. Let's just document this whole thing. You're a writer, you know, you, you, let's write down every step of the way. Let's take notes. Let's shoot video the whole way. Let's have a recorder out every step, every step of this. And so the book genuinely tracks a year of my life. When I was writing chapter three, you know, I was like 30% through what ended up being the book. I didn't know what was going to be in chapter 12, for example. So, um, I was rewriting as I went, I was, you know, journaling as I went. So, I, I knew it was going to be a book the whole time. I just didn't know what the book was going to look like. So I feel like for our listeners, we have to step back a second um, and in a way recap the sort of absence of family life you endured during your childhood. You know, you, you mentioned that the greatest fear you had as a kid was not so much your parents fighting, but it was the awful silence that often prevailed at home. You know, it was almost like there was a gap there and it got bigger and more exposed, but it could never be filled. So, you know, growing up, you know, tell us what was your parents' relationship like with one another and with you and your older brother? Um, so my parents' relationship, I mean, between them, it was toxic. I mean, they were bad. They were arranging a married and they had a, they had a bad relationship right from the start. My mother didn't want to marry him. And actually there's kind of a, a good story as to why my parents got married to begin with. Um, my dad had emigrated here from uh, Kolkata and he was, uh, he had, he had gotten a job in New Jersey. He's, I think it was an engineering job. Um, and he put an ad in a newspaper called, uh, I think it was a uh, Parat Mat Matrimony. And my grandmother and my mother, this is my grandmother on my mother's side, they were living in Toronto. My grandmother is one of about a dozen women to answer this ad looking for a wife on behalf of my mother. My mother did not know that, my, that her mother had re, uh, responded to this ad. So my dad sees this letter from my grandmother, likes what she sees about my mom, he says, I'm going to marry this woman. So he flies to Toronto to, um, to, to meet my mother. Essentially, my mother opens the door and says, who are you? And, 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 my, and my, my dad says, well, oh, I think we're getting married. And that is essentially how my parents met. My mother didn't want to marry my father, and she was pressured into it. Um, but so they, had a, they, had a, they were a bad match from the start, just personality-wise. They never took the time to communicate or get to know each other. Um, they had different interests, different worldviews. It was just never going to work. Um, and so that was the relationship between them. So, we, you know, we didn't eat dinner much together, or if we did, it was just silence the whole time. We didn't know anything about each other. They didn't know anything about us. Um, my brother and I, he's 10 years older than me. His name's Satik. And he he and I have always had a pretty good relationship. Um, but all, part of that is also that he was out of the house because he's 10 years older than me from a lot of the to toxic parts, you know? So when I was eight, 
he had left for college. That was so he was gone for a lot of my childhood. So we just had a, you know, so I think I think that's partially why we were able to kind of maintain a good relationship and get to know each other a little bit. But um, so we've always been fine. But my brother, you know, he's a good guy. Um, and so my parents are good people, too. They just they just were not a good match for each other. You know, you describe in a lot of detail the sense of alienation you felt growing up, you know, not just in your household, but at school and I guess in society more generally. You were just one of a handful of South Asians in a high school graduating class of 400 plus. You describe sort of a feeling of sadness, but also of envy, you know. Uh, how was this estrangement that you felt connected to what was going on at home? Because it seems like almost there was this conflation between your brownness and the family life at home. And you had a bunch of white kids you went to school with, and they seemed to have good family lives. And so was that the connection that you were kind of making at the time? Oh, 100%. I mean, here, here, here's, I'll never forget this. Um, when I was in sixth grade, so this is when I was probably about 12 years old. I just moved to this town called Howell, New Jersey. This is where I spent a lot of my childhood. It's right by uh, Point Pleasant Beach, you know, in kind of southern New Jersey. Uh, I went over, uh, I, met, I met this kid named Sean, who, who's now one of my best friends, but he was kind of my first like, real friend. And he invites me, um, and he invites me over to his house for dinner. And so the, 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 this is a white family and they all sit around and we're having tacos and, and, uh, you know, I start saying something and Wendy, who, who is, who is Sean's mother says, whoa, 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 hold on. We haven't all talked about our days yet. And, and, uh, so everyone went around the table. This is, you know, Sean's mom and dad and his brother and Sean, they all talked about their days. Oh, today I, you know, had a, you know, had science class and this and that, and I had practice after school or whatever. And I remember just being utterly baffled by what was happening in front of me. Like, what what is this? And and so there was a lot of that, right? And like, you know, I'd see other friends who you know who are getting coached in little league by their fathers, or you know, the list goes on and on, and encouraging them to pursue creative things or whatever. And it wasn't like that for me. And because I grew up in a mostly white town, I'd look around and be like, wow, being white seems great. I want to be white. And over over time, internally, I was like, you know what? I may be brown on the outside, but I'm going to be white on the inside. Now, I'm not saying that's right. I'm not. I'm. I'm not saying that's rational. I'm saying that that's how it manifested itself. So, essentially, you know, I just conflated, you know, whiteness with safety and warmth, and that's not correct, you know. But it, it was it. It, that's how it that's how it kind of buried itself in my mind, you know, when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. Not to mention that you had a fair amount of envy, and this is something I can totally relate to, about the white kids' lunches at school. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, this is – so in, in kindergarten, I remember, uh, you know, my – you know, a lot of kids around me would have like, you know – Dunkaroos. I think that was the well, something big back then. You know, um, you, know <laughs> you know, like they had these like cool, cool lunches, and then my mom would give me like a slice of cheese, like, and that was the lunch. I'd be like, damn, like every day, like in America, it was like this slice of cheese. What are we doing here, man? Like, let's <laughs> hey, can I get some chicken nuggets or something? You know, <laughs> it was, it was um, you know, uh, and I don't think that's unique to unique to you know my brown experience. I think a lot of brown kids have like lunch envy you know um so um yeah so that that's definitely that was definitely something that stood out as i was growing up so when you were in high school your parents ultimately divorced uh you went to college at boston university but you grew sort of further and further apart from them you didn't really know what they were up to where they lived you know you recall that when you'd see your dad's name on your caller id you would sort of cringe you know in all of this time uh, leading up to this point, you know, had you ever confronted your parents about this kind of separation or was it something that just remained sort of swept under the rug? You mean before, before the, before the, uh, the book process, before the book process. So you're sitting there in college, you know, you mentioned that I think your mom never came to visit it, uh, visit you, your dad maybe came once or twice. Um, and at some point, did you ever sort of feel this frustration where like, you know what, I'm just going to confront them and say like, what's the deal? This isn't normal, right? Where is our relationship? Why, why don't we talk? Um, no, never. I mean, we never, I mean, we're talking, when we talk about estrangement, we barely speak. When, when we spoke, it was about like the weather and what I ate that day. And that was the extent to which our conversations would go. Um, you know, we rarely spoke about anything real. Um, you know, I mean, look, but, you know, before, as I started writing the book, I didn't, not only did I not know where they were living, 
I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know their birthdays. I didn't know, you know, how they came to this country, how they met, who, who, who is our total extended family, you know, what they were like as children, what they wanted to do, what college, did they go to college? You know, I, I didn't know any of that stuff. So we were more like just these kind of acquaintances and it never even occurred to me to ask, ask those questions of which you just mentioned. You know, the heart of the book really revolves around a trip that you and your now fiance Wesley take to India. Uh, you're there to attend a, friend, a friend's wedding, but you kind of use the opportunity to reconnect with your dad and, and reestablish a relationship with him. Tell us what it felt like, you know, you're stepping off the plane in Kolkata, seeing him after all of that time. In the book, you kind of joke that it was the worst kind of semi-blind date. You know, take us to that scene. What was going through your head? So the, the context here is that it had been 11 years since I'd seen my father. And the last time I saw that my father, you know, he, it was 2007. Um, I was a freshman at Boston University, and my dad came up to visit me. And he didn't look well. He looked kind of haggard. He looked like life had kind of beaten him down. And he was just kind of, you know, whatever. But I, 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 you know, we had kind of one of our silent lunches. He got me some groceries and they went on his way. And then a couple weeks later, he left for India without telling anybody. He just left. And, and, I, and for 11 years, I never asked him why he left, you know, what, you know where he was. And in fact, when we decided to reconnect with him, I had to ask him where to book the ticket to because I didn't know where in India he was living. And the reason I mention all that is that I, I assume that he would look like a, a version of himself that was 11 years worse than what I saw in 2007. So I was expecting, I, mean, I was like, is he going to be a, have a walker? Is he going to have, you know, if maybe he got remarried. Is he going to have this like kind of white beard? Like, what is he going to look like? What is this, you know, wh what does he look like? And when we get off the plane in Kolkata and we're standing on the sidewalk outside, now keep in mind, I've never been to India. So there's, you're greeted with this kind of chaos that is, can be very unsettling at first. Um, I see my dad striding towards us. Now, the other thing to think about is that my dad sent me a picture a couple of days before the, uh, we landed. Uh, that was like, here's what I look like now in case you're looking, if when you, in case you forget. And, and, the picture has this, my dad wearing these big sunglasses and a big baseball cap, which is like the exact picture you send someone when you don't want to be recognized. <laughs> and, you know, and so I, so I really didn't know what to expect. So we, so we land and I see this guy striding towards us and my dad looked great. He had, his arms were toned, full head of hair. He's wearing a dress shirt. You know, he's telling us that he uh, does yoga and, 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 and plays tennis three times a week and, you know, golfing. He's a part of the cosmology. He, 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 he was active. I mean, it was as if, like, he didn't have time for us. And it was like, I, I was just so shocked to see this kind of rebuilt version of my father that, you know, I, I was, it was really shocking, frankly. And I, I, I give him a lot of credit for kind of reinventing himself, but there's a part of me that was like, well, you know, where was this version of you for the last 30 years of my life? Um, so it was very, um, it, it was, it was quite shocking, really. And, you know, I just have to note, like every good Indian uncle, one of the first things your dad tells you is, uh, you, you look kind of different. You put on weight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and he did that a bunch of times. It was funny. He didn't mean anything by it. It was just, he's like, uh, over, over the, you know, we were supposed to go to that wedding and, and, and every time we, we went shopping for wedding clothes and he goes, he goes, uh, yeah, I bought you all these wedding clothes, but I have to buy you new clothes because none of them will fit you. <laughs> you know, so there, there was, there was quite a bit of that. Um, so you and Wesley spend several days in Kolkata with your dad. Then the three of you travel across North India on a sightseeing trip. You go to Jaipur, you go to Delhi, you go to Agra. At some point on that trip, in one of your many conversations, your dad asks you, you know, did we ever disconnect our relationship? And he sort of starts by answering his own question by saying, you know, well, maybe from your side. But it seems like as much as you were trying to find closure from talking to your dad, do you think that he was trying to get the same from you, like sort of, you know, find closure on his own end? That's a good question. I don't know. I think my dad, if he had a core goal from this trip, it was to connect with me for the first time in a meaningful way. Because I think my dad never thought he'd see me again. I, I don't think my father, I, you know, and frankly, I didn't ever think I'd see my father again. I think my dad was just so thrilled to have this experience with me 
anything beyond that, any other, whether it's closure or whatever, that was not, um, I, I think he would have considered that a, a cherry on top. But his primary goal was to just spend this time with me because he, I don't think he ever thought he was going to have that. And I, I think about, I think about, as I, as I learned about kind of the life he's been living, I, I think a lot about that he, he's at his core a very, very lonely man. You know, he spent a lot of his life on his own, even if he was surrounded by people. I think that when he moved to India, you know, he's lived by himself for the last 11 years. Um, something that really stuck out to me was this notion of um, he traveled um, by himself quite a bit. And when we traveled to Jaipur, Agra, Delhi, wherever, it was the first time in his life. And this is a man that's almost 80. He had never traveled with someone who was not a tour group person, you know, in his life. It was his first time he traveled with someone that was going out of their way to travel with him. And that really stuck with me. And to your point about closure, here's, here's an interaction that's always stuck out to me. I, I will carry this moment with me for the rest of my life. Near the end of the trip, I asked my father to record a, a video message to, to his grandchildren. So meaning, you know, me and Wesley's children, if that ever happens, you know, just in case they never get to meet him, you know, I'd like to pass on something to them of, of, of my father. So we turn on the iPhone and my dad says something along the lines of, you know, they must learn about India. And I, and I was like, okay, dad, you know, I, I was kind of hoping that you'd say something about, you know, advice, giving advice, you know, maybe that they should be kind or, you know, you know, not about like academics, you know, what do you have? How do you want them to live your life, live their life? And he goes, oh, that's it. I want them to learn about India. And it occurred to me, in that moment, when he when he meant India, he meant himself. Like he, he 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 he, but he was too proud to say it. He wanted me to pass him on to them. He wanted me to tell my kids about him, and and because for all this time, my dad was under the impression that you know we'd have kids and we would never tell our kids about my father and where my kids came from, and that was a really profound moment uh, in this in this in this journey because I, it, it really illustrated how, how big our gap was and what my dad thought the gap was as well and how, what he had resigned himself to. And that's, that's something that has stayed with me ever since we had that exchange. I mean, I want to ask you about your mom as well. Um, who's living in New Jersey. Uh, you disc, you discuss, you know, the mental health issues that your mom endured, but that you guys never really spoke openly about. Um, again, it's another kind of taboo subject, just like divorces in the South Asian community. You know, I think at one point, I think you may have been in middle school. You didn't speak to your mom for, for almost an entire year. She, she's kind of stayed in her room whenever she was at home. Um, do you ever think about how things might have been different had she gotten the help that she needed? Is that something that um, that you guys have talked about? Is that something that you've sort of pondered? I, I ponder it every day. I mean, every day I ponder this. Every day I think about what would have happened if someone in my mom's life in the 60s and 70s and 80s um, said, hey, you know, uh, let's 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 go see a counselor. Let's go get you some help. You're clearly, you know, um, you know, there's clearly some stuff going on here. What, you know, we could all use it. it not just my mom, my dad too, and my brother and me. Um, um, in my parents' generation, especially for immigrants, I think therapy is something that was looked at as for like, quote unquote, you know, crazy people, you know, and that's, that's not, you know, the case, right. It, you know, um, that's not, you know, I think my parents, it's not so much that they rejected therapy. It's more that they didn't even have the language to know what it did or how it could help or what it is and who it treats. And so, yeah, I think about that all the time. Um, I, I, but it starts with my mother. I think my mother needed to want it. And I didn't know that. I don't know that she knew that she needed it. You know, I don't think she knew that exists as a viable option. But remember this, right? Like our parents, you know, my parents came here to survive. They wanted to get to the end of the day. You know, they were worried about putting food on the table. They were worried about paying bills and because they didn't come here with lunch. I grew up in a middle class New Jersey suburb. I didn't worry about where my next meal was coming from. You know, I lived in a house. I didn't worry about, you know, 
I didn't worry about that stuff. I had the freedom to think about my emotions and to think about, oh, I'm sad today. You know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I got dumped today. I'm going to be sad about it and I'm going to talk to people about it. I, I would like to be a comedian, so I'm going to pursue that. You know, that's going to be my therapy. My parents never had the mental, um, you know, freedom to really think about that because they were so worried about surviving. So I, so I, I wish my parent, my, my, my parents both got the treatment they so, they so needed, but they just, you know, it, they just didn't know that it existed or didn't know that it was a viable option for them. You know, so Ben, obviously this story is about your family. It's about your life. It's sort of unwise or, or dangerous, maybe even to kind of generalize this to the broader South Asian community. But in the last chapter of your book, you have this to say, and I want to just read this quote, a significant portion of the South Asian experience is about seeming a certain way to give off the impression of stability and status at the expense of emotional needs. And that's something that really struck a chord with me. You know, unpack that for us. What do you mean by that? You know, so in the first half of my childhood, I, I, I lived in a place called Randolph, New Jersey, which is about two hours north of where uh, Howell, which I, where I ended up moving to. But, you know, another North Jersey suburb, you know, and, and there there were a lot more Bengalis around. Um, and so I was part of Bengali community and it would strike me how how much my mom would give off this impression of a happy thriving family and how everyone would kind of be um it almost felt like she everyone was trying to one-up each other oh my son's taking piano lessons oh well my son's taking violin lessons you know and it felt like all my accomplishments were not mine they were my parents accomplishments um because they wanted to kind of give off this this image of of um of a family that has achieved the American dream. And in some ways, right, my parents did achieve the American dream, which is they immigrated here. They raised two kids that are pretty successful. They'd done okay. You know, my dad made it as an electrical engineer. You know, he had a very successful career for 20, 30 years, however long he did it for. But, you know, it, it was always giving off this impression of happiness that I think was kind of, at the, it, it was putting up a facade in so many ways. And I feel like I see that a lot with, 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 um, Indian parents. Um, now with that being said, you know, as, as I've always, I always feel like I, I have to give this caveat, but it's an important caveat. You know, my story is not the story of all Indians or all South Asians or all South Asian parents. Like there are plenty of, you know, South Asian parents that are, perfectly healthy, have healthy relationship with each other, have healthy relationship with their children and, and all that stuff. I, I'm just speaking from my own experience. From from my own experience, there just seemed to be this kind of community pressure to seem a certain way, to seem successful, to seem happy, to to seem like your, you know, your kid is, you know, doing great at all times. Um, so that that's what I mean by seeming a certain way. Um, it, it just felt disingenuous some of the time, a lot of the time, really, when we, when we were growing up. So I have to ask you, you know, the book is out. Um, your parents kind of watched you in a way, you know, write it or at least, you know, do the research for it. Um, have they had a chance to read the book? And if so, you know, what do they make of it? Um, they have read the book. Uh, they read a manuscript of it about a year ago. Um, so the context you know, I feel like I keep giving you context. I apologize. Um, uh, so I told them up front, you know, that, that I was doing this. The entire time, I was very communicative, like, we're doing a book, we're tracking this whole process, and it's going to be the unvarnished truth about our family. You know, it's going to be unvarnished. It's, 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 I'm not going to leave much out. You know, this is going to be, you know, my truth or whatever. They both had very complicated reactions because a process like this requires all parties to look inward you know, and requires all parties to kind of look in the mirror. And everyone has ver varying abilities to do that. Um, so that was definitely the case for my parents. It was the case for me, you know, whatever. Um, ultimately, I think it was very difficult for them to see how difficult my childhood was on, on paper and how difficult our family was on, on, on paper. Ultimately, I think they came around and understood what I was trying to do. Um, my dad had a particularly funny reaction after reading it, which was, he goes, you wrote a book. I'm proud of you. You've inspired me to write my own book and I shall take your help with it. 
and <laughs> and, and uh, he so he has been ever since reading my book, he has now been penning his own autobiography called um, uh, My Story or something like that. And he wants he's going to send me his notes and he wants me to write them up because his English is you know not that you know not not amazing. Um, so it, it, they they both had very complicated reactions. Ultimately, they understood what I was trying to do, uh, and you know. I also would say that this process is ongoing. This isn't a Hallmark movie. This thing is not overnight. You know, this is going to be years, uh, years of relationship healing, whether, and there are going to be peaks and there are valleys. And, you know, we've had our moments that are difficult. Uh, we've had our moments that are great. Um, it's just, it's just, you know, you can't erase 30 years of what is essentially estrangement and trauma in the course of a year. There, there are several, you know, steps that have to happen before that. This book is a story of getting to know your family, of course, but it's also about figuring out who you really are. You know, when you worked uh, in television, uh, you covered a heated Trump rally uh, on the 2016 campaign trail where you were famously or infamously manhandled by the Chicago cops. And you write in the book that your skin color never felt as hot as it did when the Trump campaign went to Chicago. You know, that feeling of being different, of being so aware about your brownness, about your skin color, that, that feeling you felt so intensely as a child... Does that still resonate with you? Does it still stick with you in the year 2020, given where we are in our own country and our socially divisive politics? I mean, do you feel that same sense of, you know, I'm different and I look different and I feel different? Yeah, 100%. Um, for, 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 several, for, several, for several reasons. I mean, ever since the, the Chicago arrest changed my mindset a lot. But even just just since then, I'm hyper aware of it in a way that, uh, I, I don't think I was as hyper aware before 2016, um, especially, you know, in, you know, in, in the during during the Trump administration, like, like, you know, when I covered the Trump campaign, I remember, you know, somebody coming up to me and asking me if I was a member of ISIS. Right. Or somebody told me, uh, came up to me and told me to go back to Iraq, which, uh, you know, I'm not Middle Eastern. And even if I was, that's a totally inappropriate thing to say. Thing to say. Um, so, yeah, I'm hyper aware of it now. Um, so. I'm also hyper aware of it kind of in the, in the book world, right? Like, you know, it's hard. It's harder as a person of color to get a book, let's say, even bought. And I'm very thankful Hartford for Carver Collins did, but it wasn't easy to sell this book. Um, it's not easy. You know, this, this is a book that has been mostly ignored by book critics in the country, you know, because a lot of book critics are white and they're not, you know, maybe they don't find this story interesting. Um, you know, just just you know, just in this kind of narrow narrow world, I th I think about this quite a bit. Like if if you know, because I see a lot of let's say white writers writing memoirs, and you know, and I see you know glossy reviews and like you know a bunch of outlets, and I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And so you can't help but wonder, look in the mirror and go, oh, is this because I am different? Is this because the people that are you know making these decisions don't look like me? I mean, so I, I've been hyper aware of it in many different world, many different ways going back to 2016. Um, and I, was, I should say, like, that is not a credit to me or, you know, what's crazy to me is, like, how are you not more aware of it before 2016? And that's that kind of goes to show you the level of my identity crisis, <laughs> you know, up until that point. My guest on the show today is the New York Times journalist Sopan Deb, author of the brand new memoir, Mistranslations, Meeting the Immigrant Parents Who Raised Me. Sopan, thanks so much for coming on the show. This was a really uh, painful read in many ways, but uh, one that I immensely enjoyed. It was so well done, so well written. And, you know, I think like many of your readers, you know, I'm eager anyway to, to figure out sort of what the next chapter is, the next story in your family uh, with your parents. So thanks so much for, for sharing that with us. And thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Production assistance comes from Megan Maxwell and Rachel Osnos. Tim Martin is our audio engineer and Lauren Dueck is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week.